so that is our prayer, Lord. We can have much knowledge that just goes in our head, and we can externally fix ourselves and make ourselves look sharper. But it's like washing a car, Lord, with engine problems. So come right now and do your work on the inside and on the outside, but in that order, Lord, from the inside out. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can be seated. The kids are dismissed now for Children's Church. The scripture text is before you. Let's read it together and then I'll explain it to you. It's 2 Corinthians verse 13, chapter 13, verses 11 through 14. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. And the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. That's God's word. And now we get to try to understand it and see how it helps us worship. This is Paul's letter to Corinth. And what do we know about Corinth? Corinth's an old city. Its origins actually go back 2,000 years before the coming of Christ. That means while Abraham was living, people were settling in Corinth. Corinth is a fantastically located city. I've been on a cruise to Greece, but I never made it to Corinth. But it's on an isthmus at the bottom there, and it's on a four and a half mile stretch of land between two harbors. So it's got a Mediterranean feel to it. So it's a coastal town, but it's also shielded and protected under a huge mountain rock. So it's kind of like maybe San Francisco or something in that it is a mountain coastal city. It's an affluent city. It had become a financial hub of its day because it was on one of the major trade routes between the east and the west. And especially because sailors found it and merchants found it very dangerous and expensive to go around the southern tip of the island there. And they actually found it more beneficial to take their ship and all their cargo and put it on skids and kind of have an overland canal from one port to the next right through the place where Corinth was. And so it was a place of merchants and sailors and tradesmen and all of those who were courting their business. It was a world-class city. When I think of world-class cities today, I think of Rome and I think of London and New York City. But in that day, Corinth was one. It had its own rich history. In addition, Alexander and Caesar in the Greek empires and the Roman empires saw it as a jewel of their empires. Quite a city. But it was a carnal city. It would be very fair to say what happened in Corinth stayed in Corinth. You who are engaged in business understand kind of what happens to the psyche and the practice. When, when you get out of town, you get with your friends and you're being courted and you're somewhere where people don't necessarily know your name, the vice that kind of stirs from within and ends up being displayed without, and especially if you're in an environment that says, come party with us. I've never been to Vegas, but my understanding is when you go there for a convention, you don't have to go looking for sin. Sin comes looking for you. That was the case here in Corinth. And it didn't help that they were so religious because from up on the mountain, the Acro-Corinth, they called it, was the temple of Aphrodite. And from there, it was said that a thousand prostitutes would come down every night into the city seeking to do religion with people who needed to worship with them it was a carnal city but it was a targeted and a graced city if you remember in the old testament where god sent jonah to nineveh why god just said we're going to go there and show grace 
The same thing is said of Jesus as he was traveling. He must go through Samaria. The Holy Spirit said, we're going there. And the Holy Spirit sent Paul to the city of Corinth. Paul traveled there and he met up with Silas and Timothy, Aquila and Priscilla. And there through that team, God did incredible work there. For 18 months he labored. For 18 months the Holy Spirit poured out his favor on that city. They told people about the gospel. They made disciples. They taught the word of God. They pastored. They counseled. They exercised their spiritual gifts. They gathered for worship. Paul developed leaders, and after 18 months, he left behind a church, a church of sinful saints, people who still struggled with the world, the flesh, and the devil, but were called saints by Jesus Christ because of what Jesus had done for them. And so that's where Paul was, and it was a gorgeous, fruitful time of ministry until the same spirit that led Paul to Corinth said, it's it's time to go, Paul. So at that point, Paul took off. He went to Ephesus, Jerusalem, and Antioch. His third missionary journey started. But though his feet wandered from Corinth, not his heart, he stayed in touch. And he heard the good news, and he heard the bad news. You see, while Paul was there, Paul had taught them the plan of God. The will of God. It was the will of God that they understand Jesus' grace. It was the will of God that they receive and swim in the unfathomable love of God the Father. It was God's will that they engage in fellowship with the Holy Spirit, that they enjoyed the Trinity, and that the Trinity brought them and their brothers and sisters in, and that they were going to be family. And Paul had taught them that's the plan of God. And Paul had taught them before that when there is schism in the family of God, what are we to do? We are to aim for restoration. We are to counsel and encourage and comfort one another. We're to be humble. We're to be like-minded in the gospel. We're to, to guard the peace and purity of the church. We're to confess our sins. We're to forgive quickly. We're to reconcile. This is the plan of God for his people. For that's what God has done for us. The grace, love, and fellowship of the Trinity has been given to us individually. We've been invited to come in, but not just individually. We've been invited to join the the celestial party. They love each other, and they love us, and we're to love one another. And when people see this right here, it's supposed to point them to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Paul had taught them that but as Paul is traveling abroad he hears of the pain the devil had had his way with God's saints in the church that's right those saints that are considered blameless in the eyes of God they were being greatly hurt by one another by their leaders and they were harming each other. The list of sins is long in First and Second Corinthians. Self-promoting leaders. Slanderous speech. Congregational factions. Some said, I, I like Paul's preaching better. Others said, no, 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 he's no good. I like Apollos' preaching better. Sexual promiscuity in the church and outside so that the reputation of Christ in the church was sullied. Errant, legalistic, and judgmental brothers. Those people who sat back and looked at people and said, I cannot believe those people are doing that. Other people who were arrogant and apathetic libertines who said, I have the right to do whatever I want and I could care less what my brothers and sisters think. I'm going to do what I think is right. Worshippers ignoring body life and selfishly engaging in worship actually coming to the Lord's Supper and gorging themselves on the food, getting drunk on the wine, and not leaving something for everyone to enjoy and participate in. People uncharitably practicing their spiritual gifts, 
making a big deal of what God is doing through me, but doing it in a puffed up, egotistical manner of ministry. Super apostles, those people who could wow with their words, but were so dangerous as they seeded discord. Yes, the grace of Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit was not being practiced and enjoyed. And the pain was great. Therefore, even though he was distant, Paul led. He wrote four letters to this church. He sent emissaries with his letters in his name to the church. One time he even visited, and it was called the painful visit. Paul just could not sit by as a leader and watch the unified body of Christ in Corinth suffer division. It hurt him too much to do so. And so Paul writes letters, letters of encouragement, letters of discouragement, letters of grace, letters of justice, Sometimes his words were smooth and easy to digest. And other times, not so much. And if you were to read 2 Corinthians, that's what you would see. The first half is called his letter of thanksgiving. But his second half of the letter, (laughs) not so much. People would have looked at him and said, Paul, why are you so negative? But Paul was showing grace as he was calling his brothers and his sisters to see their sin, see their Savior, and respond accordingly, respond properly. It was not okay at all for there to be division in the church. So Paul was forced to defend his calling, defend his character, defend his apostleship, and even defend the gospel that he preached. Because when he was gone, people came in and were teaching false truths to his people. In the second half of 2 Corinthians, he confronted, he scolded, he warned. And one commentator has rightly said, it was a menacing onslaught. You have time to read today. Go see if what I say is true. Paul took the gloves off. He dropped the hammer. He called out his friends and his foes, but he didn't do so in anger or in malice heart was broken he hated the devil he hated the world he hated sin it had no bearing it shouldn't have been there in the church and Paul went after it but then Paul came to the conclusion which we have here and how did the good apostolic father and Christian patriarch end his letter with grace it will surprise you if you read those chapters before this is like wow does this even belong and some interpreters have said they put together letters that don't belong and call it 2 Corinthians but no Paul has done what he needed to be done the rebuke has been given but he will not let his people go home without grace and so if you're my friends and you have heard the plan of God and you understand that we're supposed to be walking in the grace love and fellowship and then you realize That ain't always the case. The Holy Spirit is speaking to us right now. And he's saying, but I have grace for you. Notice the grace in the title. Their position. Finally, brothers. He doesn't address them as antichrists or antagonists, as even enemies. Not even just as good neighbors. And he doesn't address them as children, as if I'm on the higher level, you're on the lower level. One day you may ascend to my plateau of sanctification. No, he is very happy after laying down the lumber to look at them and say, Finally, my siblings, brothers and sisters of the Father, of Abba, you may be sinful. I may have had to call you out, but I am the chiefest of sinners. And you are my brothers. Beautiful words. Then he expresses the plan. Paul does this in several of his epistles at the end. He kind of repeats in staccato form, very quickly, 
a review of the really gracious law that God gives. See, the law is not gracious if one has to keep it in order to make God happy and earn eternal life. But after one is reconciled with God, the law becomes incredibly gracious for it expresses wisdom. You still can't keep it all the time, and you don't have to because Jesus has done it for you. But who wouldn't want to follow after the will and wisdom of God? And so here are six quick imperatives. We are to cheer up. Despite our sin, we are to rejoice. Despite the way we have been harmed and we harm others, we are to sing loudly about the gospel. We are to fix up. We are to aim for restoration in ourselves and with others. There's some discrepancy on how you're supposed to interpret this, but it works both ways. Like John and James repaired or restored their nets, this is what we're to do with our own hearts, with our own friends. When we see that there's a, a division, aim for restoration. We're to coach up. We're to encourage and exhort and use our mouths and God's doctrine to call people to the best that Christ has for them. We're to team up and work together in like-minded unity. Some might even say in harmony. We're to think God's thoughts together and on those main primary cardinal doctrines, we're to come together and not let those secondary things divide us. We're to live in peace and we are to kiss. Now, Gordon, I need you to be careful here. This is where we've got to be careful about practical application. I'm not asking for all the 16-year-old guys to find 16-year-old girls and engage in a kiss. Maybe if it was a holy kiss, but I'm just not sure that's possible. But you see it in the Scripture over and over again. It was kind of a Jewish and Gentile custom. You still see it in Russia and the Middle East where people go and they give kisses. I do that sometimes to my daughter Ashlyn as I grab her head and with great fatherly care just put her forehead right here and give her a kiss right on the forehead there. It's kind of my thing I do. Doesn't weird her out too much. But I'm telling you that if Dan Polster walks up to me and plants a kiss right here, even if it is biblical, I'm not. I'm uncomfortable with that, Dan. But you see, in the Old Testament culture and in the New Testament culture, when the prodigal son received his son back, he embraced and kissed him. When Mary wanted to show her love, she kissed the Savior's feet over and over again. Judas did that horrible act of taking that sacred gesture and using it to betray Jesus. In Acts 20, when Paul is seeing the Ephesian elders for the last time, they weep. They embrace him. And they kiss him over and over and over again and in five other places in the New Testament Peter and Paul command the church with an imperative give one another the holy kiss what does that mean it had taken on a particular nature in the Christian church it appears this was kind of like a not really a sacrament, but a practice. So in some churches, we have the sacraments of the Lord's Supper and baptism, but other churches have these other practices they do, like maybe washing feet or embracing one another in a kiss. And the early church appears to have done this as a part of their communion service. Before you went up to the table and took your seat and participated in the agape love fest meal, you greeted one another with the holy kiss. For this showed affection. It showed reconciliation. It also showed equality. Because only in the church of Jesus Christ would you have Jews and Gentiles kissing one another. Only in the church of Jesus Christ would you have members who are slave and members who are free coming together and embracing in that sacred rite of affection, equality, and reconciliation. And Paul says... You hear these commands, you put all six of those together. That's what I want you to do now as a result of my letter. You are to be living in grace, in love, and in fellowship. You are not living in grace, in love, and fellowship. You're harming each other and being harmed. Now focus on each other. Love each other. Go after each other. Guard the peace and purity of the church at all means. And kiss a whole lot. 
because it shows one another and the world that you are people who are enjoying the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And then Paul ends with his promise in two ways. A little shorter version of it's right there. As you do these six things, the God of love and the God of peace will be with you. And you're saying, well, isn't the God of love and peace always with us? And the answer is yes, but experientially, it'll be like he's there in the room, like paradise found, like a taste of heaven on earth. Like when we pray, thy will be done on earth as it's in heaven, like our saints who have gone on before us are enjoying God's grace and love and fellowship perfectly. These six commands, if we do them, we get to experience the God of peace, which is mentioned all over the Bible. But the God of love is mentioned nowhere other than right here, that by that title. And that God, he's with you. Paul greets them, tells them to greet one another, tells them about other churches that are praying and want to greet them as well. And then Paul gives that benediction. Some say it's the most dear benediction. I was grateful that Jim prescribed this and I got to go and study this for a week and a half. Do you see the promise? It's a gospel promise. This promise here, though, has nothing to do with your performance. This promise here has to do with performance, but not yours. This promise here has to do with the performance of Jesus Christ. And because you are one in Christ and Christ is in you, because you are united, because you have received grace love and fellowship already and it can't be taken away Paul then in good Presbyterian manner raises his hands towards Corinth and those people in Corinth in good Presbyterian fashion read that letter and I hope they turned their hands like this and said give it to me good give it to me good and Paul looked at the sinful saints in Corinth and he said, may the Trinity bless you. May the grace of Jesus Christ that is greater than all your sin. And may the love of God the Father. You know how much love the Father has for Jesus? Well, that's how much the Father has for you because you are in Jesus. There is nothing that would disturb his love for you. Because it's not based on you, it's based on Jesus. And the fellowship of the Holy Spirit or in the Holy Spirit, however you want to interpret that, may it be with you all. That was the promise that he gave. They were a people, those Corinthians, who despite their carnality and hedonism had received grace, love, and fellowship. They were people who even right then were receiving grace, love, and fellowship. And for the rest of their days, they would. Paul is looking at them saying, now, let's practice. And that's how we conclude. We are people buffeted by Satan. Think about that. Before being reconciled in Christ, we were being treated justly as our sins deserve. Not graciously. But for some reason, God set his affection on us and determined to give us tons of blessings, material, generational, and eternal, that we don't deserve. God thwarted Satan's plan and gave us grace. Before then, we had no love for God. But we love him now because he first loved us and he poured out his love towards us by sending Jesus Christ on our behalf. There was nothing we could do to make him love us. We wouldn't do anything to make us love us because we were at enmity with him. We hated him. But God thwarted Satan's plan and he poured love into our hearts. And God invited us into the fellowship and just like the Shekinah glory of God moved into the temple, the Holy Spirit moved into our lives. That's our history. And it's true today. He just keeps showering grace on us. I was at the beach last Sunday and I got to watch the waves come in and come in and come in and come in. And they never stopped coming in. And that is as it is with God's grace. You get some and get some more and get some more and get some more. And 
It's present, his love, his grace, and his fellowship. He is here amongst us. He's here with us. Oh, how good it is and how fantastic it will be in heaven. And now we get to take that which we enjoy personally and practice in our families. You know how hard it can be to be husband, wife, father, mother, and children. It's brutal sometimes. But we get to act out that and show the world we're different. We get to take those six imperatives and rejoice as a family in the grace of Christ and not rejoice because we're that good, but because He is. Aim for restoration. Pursue peace. Counsel and comfort one another. Live in unity and harmony and hug and kiss and embrace and show one another that we are family. And oh, how Satan wants to tear apart your own personal experience of God's grace, love, and fellowship, your family's experience. And I really feel that he has targeted Horizon Church. We've heard the plan, but there can be much pain here. Some believe the coronavirus is a pandemic. Some believe the coronavirus is a conspiracy. Some believe masks are a display of love. Some believe it is a display of fear. Some think the elders of this church are incredibly wise. Some question that. Some might say in regards to preaching, I am of Jim. Others might say, I am of Joe. Someone else might say, I'm of someone else. Can you find them? Some might say of musical styles, it's too contemporary and too loud. It repeats itself too often. Some might say it's too traditional and too mellow. Some might question staffing decisions, ministry priorities, budget decisions, misjudging motives. Some might engage in slander and gossip. Some might be leaders who abuse. Others might be leaders who are apathetic and not as involved as they should be. Some might respect, respect their leaders. We are always tempted to forsake our vows. Satan would love to destroy Horizon Church. But we're okay. Because we're just a bunch of brothers swimming, swimming in the grace, love, and fellowship of God. This is His promise to us. And we get to practice it. And we might even start practicing it by engaging in the right hand of fellowship, the holy kiss, the magic fist bump, the chest bump, the way that we worship together, the way that we eat and drink together, the way we do community groups together, the way we come to the sacraments together, and the way we quickly confess our sins, forgive those who sin against us, and guard the peace and purity of the church. I think Corinth did so. Paul went back he doesn't mention it again. He was able to take a collection from there and send it to the people in Jerusalem. And I think he wrote Romans from Corinth after this letter. The people heard God's plan, recognized their pain, but realized God's promise. And they responded and practiced accordingly. May that be what we do for all of our days at Horizon. As the love of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit guides us home. How much does God love us? If you'll turn in your bulletins to Romans chapter 8. This is what grace, love, and fellowship looks like. And this is ours. God has promised it to us. So would you please stand? And would you please engage in this responsive reading as Jim leads us in this and then in a time of prayer to follow.